It was a very colourful place, you know. I mean, I liked it. It was very rough. But uh, what I found is in Withenshaw that, because it's a, it's a working class area predominantly, but you bond very quickly with the street kids, you know, which gives you a sort of identity, I think. Um, and as I said earlier, you know, Withenshaw is, is rubbing gas meters and rubbing the telly meter, you know. It was hell. Hell. But good souvenirs uh, uh, with the kids that I used to hang out with at that time. But it was a right dump. Horrible. I mean, uh, there's unemployment, uh, robbing, cast, stealing, all that kind of crap. Um, but there was, um, how can I say, in our small community in where, where, where I used to live, it was, uh, it was, it was just the typical Coronation Street kind of life. You know, like watching Coronation Street, you just get in there, in, into the pub, have a chat and everything, and everybody tell you what they've been doing, all the problems and all, all that. So, uh, just like basically any other English, uh, Council House Town, uh, as you'd say. But, uh, all right, it's changed radically since uh, I last lived here, you know. But memories of it, just fun, you know. Especially when we started the band, it, it, it gave us uh, an identity and a purpose because you're pretty much lost for, for direction. You don't get any from school, especially the schools we went to. So, uh, you form friendship really quickly, I think, with kids on the street, and the street becomes your culture, so to speak. So, you know, good memories of it. Uh, I'm a believer, the monkeys. I was the first one, because uh, I, I used to watch the TV show, the monkeys and everything. I thought it was great. And, uh, I think the, the, the second one, the second was an EP. It was an Elvis Presley one that I picked up, uh, which was um, the four tracks of uh, Jailhouse Rock, if I remember rightly, on the MCA. That was the, the first two. The rest I can't remember. <laughs> first record, Starman, David Bowie. But the first record, that I ever listened to was my brother came home with, um, I think it was called Hey America by James Brown, because he was a mod. <clears throat> and we used to share a room and we had bunk beds. So he was, you know, I got, I, I got uh, exposed to mod music very early. But, you know, I didn't quite understand it, Tamla Motown and the stack stuff. But the first record I bought was Starman. The first gig I went to um, the first gig I went to was, um, I think it was Freddie and the Dreamers. Because uh, my mum and dad had, had some tickets or something like that. I, I, was a, I don't know, I'm sitting around eight or nine, something like that. But uh, I can't really remember the gig. A lot of people, that's it. I think the faces in Bellevue, yeah. I think so. Great gig, man. The album that changed my life was Ziggy Stardust and Transformer. Both brilliant albums and Stand Up Today. Why? Just a fucking great, that's why. Ziggy Stardust. No doubt. Uh, and because uh, because I, th I think that Z the album Ziggy Stardust was so far into the future and nobody had ever done anything like that. Um, it was just like a complete eye-opener uh, for everybody. And the songwriting is absolutely brilliant. The vocals are pff, over the top. And uh, Ronson's guitar is really rocking on it. So that, that was the main album what, what hit me. Dog Day Afternoon, Al Pacino. Why? I just thought it was so absurd, the situation that this character had got himself in. Um, and then I learned that it was based on a true story, you know? 
there's a couple. Um, there's a, there's a, a, an English film, <coughs> uh, which is uh, actually it's, I think it's a, I think it's a remake. Actually, I'm not sure. Uh, um, which was uh, an Alfred Hitchcock film at the beginning, um, and it was I can't remember the title, what it was. It was um, what was it called? Uh, something with Harry or whatever. Trouble with Harry or whatever. I can't remember what, it, what the title was. It was a really really good film, but uh, the films, the the real films, what changed my life was uh, the French ones, A Man and a Woman, Truffaut. Um, I love I love all the French films. I love uh, I love um, Alain Delon, um, <clears throat> um, Jean Gabin, uh, even Bonville, who's a, uh, a comic. Um, I'm more into the French films rather than uh, the English and the American ones. I think it was it Trouble, was it Trouble with Harry, the Alfred Hitchcock one. I'm not sure. I think it was that one. That was a great film. Okay, uh, I met him at Shaston High School, which we both attended. <coughs> um, my first impression was he's a fucking nutcase. Um, we got talking and, and uh, uh, we, we found that we had the same influences musically, you know, like Roxy Music, Bowie. And, uh, you know, I think I just discovered guitar, like hearing guitar, you know, and I said I like this guitarist called Mick Ronson, and he's like, oh, well, I like Alice Cooper. So we said, well, we should form a band, not knowing the first thing how to go about forming a band. So he says, well, why don't you come over to my house, and he lived in the box room at his mum's house, and we'll talk about it. So I went up, up to his box room, and he had these um, garden gnomes, which he'd stolen from all around the neighborhood, and painted Alice Cooper eyes on them. So they had the Alice Cooper makeup, and and then there was some which he'd burnt and distorted the features because they were like kind of plastic, you know. And I just thought, uh, he's mad. But I liked him because he was out there. And what I liked about Wayne is, from the first meeting, was I got the sense then is what you see is what you get. And I like that. I like that openness and honesty. School, met him at school. <clears throat> uh, he was he's a year younger than, than I am, and um, I was looking for a, I was looking for a couple of musicians to play with because I'd been playing a double bass at school, and that because I was playing it on my own, I was it was just like a boring thing. So I was looking for somebody to play play with at that time, and I asked uh, uh, Mick if he'd like to uh, play double bass. Now, seeing Mick, as he's not a big lad, <laughs> uh, behind a double bass, it lasted for uh, about a week, and then uh, he went on to the guitar. And uh, from there on, it, we just started writing songs together. Uh, I think it was, it must have been early 70s, 72, 73, something like that. Well, one is, is uh Wayne and I started writing really early on. I mean, this is pre-punk rock. Um, and we didn't know how to write songs. I don't think there's, a, there's a, a recipe to how to write songs or a blueprint, you know? So we, we'd written these songs, and I felt that th it, there was something going on. There was a connection, and we were too naive and, and green to understand what was going on, but there was something, you know? and. We, we increased the writing as much as we could, you know, so it started w once a week, we'd meet, then we'd meet two, two three times. And we, we kind of hit a point where I think we both realized that we could have a, a go at this, you know. A and honestly, there was nothing else for us. It was, we were both on the dole. Um, I'd had a job in a factory, uh, like a mail order factory place, and that lasted three weeks. And I think Wayne, Wayne had a job in the same place, and he went off and did something else. But it, it, it was just a feeling that kept drawing us back, you know. It, it was never really like, well, there's music, and let's see what else is on offer. Because there wasn't. But, and, and it touched us emotionally and, and, and uh, spiritually, I think.
Sounds like a big word to say about punk rock, but you know. So. My mum had a pub <coughs> in, uh, in Stratford, which was called the Angel Hotel. And um, she used to have a band who used to play up upstairs. Re they used to rehearse upstairs. I c it was like the Cherry and the Pacemakers kind of style. Of, um, and I used to go into the rehearsals, and I was only about nine, something like that. And um, I just heard them play, and I said, I want to do that. So uh, I reckon that it was most probably that band, but I can't remember their, their name whatsoever, uh, that got me into it originally. And then uh, <clears throat> I think it was um, watching Hendrix on, uh, on some TV show. I can't remember what it was, a TV show. And uh, I think it was Voodoo Child, if I remember. And I said, that's, that's what I want to do. <laughs> Wayne, it's a great name, and it's a combination of Slaughter on 10th Avenue from Mick Ronson and Diamond Dogs, because we were both, uh, you know, fans of those uh, great people. Well, it changed everything for us, uh, watching the Pistols, because, you see, <clears throat> we, were, we were punks without being punks. I mean, we, we used to hang out on the street, etc. We'd be fighting, beating shit out of each other. And uh, we had that punk attitude. Uh, but uh, we didn't really know what the punk music thing was because punk hadn't, hadn't even started at that time uh, when we started playing. Because uh, I, remember, I think there might have been Patti Smith, uh, the Ramones, um, Eddie and the Hot Rods. Um, but I think that the, like, bands like The Clash, that I, I love, uh, uh, they were still in the garage. They were rehearsing and we were doing gigs. We were doing we'd already been doing local gigs. And uh, our reason was to get the kids off the streets and have a good time. Uh, so that was our kind of at attitude. It was a social attitude. Watching the Pistols sound check, <clears throat> and then they, they started up Anarchy. And uh, I think Steve had a, a phaser on it. And I didn't know what a phaser was, you know. And I thought, fucking hell, that sounds good, man. So they're starting to bam, 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 bam. And then John had a cold, and he got these lyrics out of his pocket, which were like in, in a ripped piece of paper with all snot on them. And he started singing this song. And I mean, really, again, that had a profound effect on hearing that, how Slaughter then progressed into, you know, what we became. Because at that time, we were still trying to emulate, you know, we, we did Suffragette City in the set and we did, uh, I think, uh, Both Ends Burning by Roxy Music. I mean, watching John and Steve on, on stage and Glenn and Paul, it's brilliant, absolutely brilliant, because they, they were just doing the, the love-hate situation, but doing it socially, which was great. I mean, uh, um, I, used to, I used to love listening to uh, John saying, I love you, but he say it in a way that like, I hate you kind of thing. <laughs> Yeah, I am you kind of, and that was great, and uh, that was our wake-up call. So that changed everything. So that is the main, that is the main um, thing. What happened at the, the Free Trade Hall? Otherwise, uh, nothing else really happened apart from uh, Buzzcocks. well, the Buzzcocks. I mean, you know, they're nice lads, but I, I, you know, they're not our world. I mean, they're they're, they're uni university kids. Uh, I mean, Howard's, uh, you know, quite an intelligent guy. Um, went to school, etc. I mean, we didn't go to school. Uh, we were wagging it like half the year around. We were wagging, you know. So um, we wasn't in that kind of world. Um, but I do respect them. I do like them. The good guys, uh, although they used to treat us like shit and mock us, you know. It was. Uh, I had. I was around. Well, I don't. 39 degrees, I, was, I had a really bad cold, I was sweating like a pig, and somebody said to me, here, have some talcum powder, you won't, it'll stop you from sweating. And instead of putting it just on my face, kind of, I just put it all over the, over the school cape that I used to go on stage with, headmaster's cape, and um, went on stage, moved really, really quick, and it gave this kind of 
white powdered effect, you know, cloud, and uh, everyone, everybody just went, oh, what's that? You know, stage effect kind of, and then I just ad adopted it from there. You know. Yeah, again, it was all very new, you know. Um, I didn't think Decca were the coolest label. But at that time, it was like, oh, you know, every label wanted a punk rock band, which there wasn't a lot of at the time, you know, because we were right there at the beginning. So signing to Decca was, uh, I mean, obviously a great thrill for us. Um, and, and it meant we were go allowed to go into a proper studio and, and do a record. Decca, record. Decca Records was very, very strange because um, as Decca's in London, and we were still in Manchester at that time. We, we, we were preparing ourselves to move down to, to, um, to London, but um, we had no idea about record companies. Uh, I, you know, I was the oldest member of the band at that time when we signed. I think I was 17, something like that. So Mick would have been 16, and Muffet as well, and Howard. But uh, I don't know. Uh, is he, I don't really have a lot of souvenirs about that. I, I remember uh, getting along with a, a band called um, uh, uh, Little Rooster, if I remember rightly, which was uh, Gary's band. Um, and I'd go into the, I think it was the Elephant and Castle, and have a drink with him now and again, because he had, he had his band and we had ours. We were both signed to, the, to Decca. And um, it was kind of, I don't know, it was... Um, see, I never liked the business side of it. All I liked was having fun doing concerts, having a good time, writing songs and playing them on stage. And um, what, what Decca tried to do, they tried to, how could I, they tried to mold us, molded us into something that we didn't want to be. So that was kind of, um, that was kind of really, really weird because like Mick and myself, we've always wanted to do something, what we've decided to do. And when you get this third element that comes in, then it, you know, automatically problems happen. And, uh, and people were saying to me, you know, you should be doing a solo album, you should, you know, et cetera, and all that. So I couldn't understand that. It's uh, too much for me. Mick, Mick and myself, we used to um, go to all the concerts, all the Bowie and David Bowie concerts, Mick, Mick Ronson concerts. Uh, when he did his first two solo albums, we'd follow him around. And um, Mick got, I mean, I met him a few times, right? But Mick really got to know him. And he asked him to come into the studio, you know, very boldly, with and sure kind of, uh, no face kind of, no shame. And he said, yeah. So uh, he came into the studio and uh, we were all like messiah in him. And uh, it was brilliant. It was brilliant. It was, um, it was such a, such a, a gift to have that, <clears throat> that moment, to have somebody who, that you've always loved come in and do a session with you. I mean, it was, it was brilliant. My connection to Mick Ronson and, and him ending up playing on, on the records. Well, well first off, uh, in my opinion, Mick's the greatest guitar player ever. Ever, ever, ever. Just a uh, musician's musician. The most stylish guitar player I've ever seen in my life, you know. <clears throat> and super gifted. Um, so, I, I, I got to know Mick early on as a fan, and I, I think we just started slaughtering the dogs, you know, just early stages of it. So, um, I, I was very fortunate to, to know Mick and uh, became his friend, and he took me under his wing, you know. He actually gave me an MXR distortion box many, many years ago, and I, and I thought, fucking hell, that's great, you know. So, um, so, you know, he gave me his phone number and I, I'd ring him periodically and, and uh, you know, see how he was doing and that. And it was a real thrill for me to do that. I, I, I had to wait till, till my mum had gone to bed so I could use the phone. Because at that time, calling London was like, fuck, it's like calling America, you know, it was expensive. Um, so when we, when we got the record deal, I called him up all excited and says, we just got a fucking record deal, Mick, you know. We're going to make a record. As I did when I got my first Gibson. And uh, it, 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 naively, I, I says, you should come down and play on it. And he just says, all right. And so it was as simple as that. And uh, we recorded at Decca Studios in um, Highgate. This is 
studios there, excuse me. <coughs> and because um, we just got the record deal, I went out and bought Marshall. I had no idea what I was doing. I just turned everything up, you know. And then Mick came down and he put the guitar in and he went to my amp and he just kind of adjusted a few things. And it was unfucking believable There was a Ziggy Stardust sound. You know, so when he left, I wrote it all down, you know, copied it. So it was as simple as that. I just said, you should come down and play on it. And he says, all right. And, uh, you know, it was like a dream come true to me. And he played on uh, Quick Joey Small and Mystery Girls. So just, you know, lovely experience and lovely memories about it. Mm. And that's how we got to know the, the Mesa Boogie, the amplifier as well which was great because we were all Marshall, big things, you know. And he came in with this small kind of uh, amplifier, like, you know, <clears throat> Mick, do you want to um, <clears throat> use a mixer Marshall? He said, no, I'm all right, I'm all right with that. And he just thrashed it out and like everybody, even the engineer, they all stopped the session. Everybody was like looking at the amplifier. Um, Les Paul, Les Paul, I think, apart from my brother, Mick, um, I think he's the, it's the best sound of a Les Paul that has ever been recorded on album by Ronson's, so. I think we, I think internally it just fucking exploded, you know? I mean, there's not really one definitive answer that you can say it was because of that. I think, uh, being honest, I think when Wayne and I were younger, it was all rallying for space, you know, egos played into it. Um, and I think that affected both of us, you know. Uh, and if I can, you know, I'm just trying to go back there in my head right now. I think it stopped being fun too, you know. I mean, in anything artistic, you know, in painting, you know, poetry, musician, actor, it has to be fun. It's, it can be hard work, but it's got to be fun. And I think by 78, uh, around there, I think it stopped being fun. I think, uh, yeah, I think so. <coughs> Noelle and I met in a gangbang. <laughs> no, that's not true. No. Uh, Noel, I, I uh, actually he kidnapped me, Noel, because um, he found out that there was an English singer living in Lyon, and he had a band called the uh, uh, um, something uh, uh, TL something TLS or something like that, and um, he, f he found out that there was this English singer in Lyon, and uh, he came to the. He came to my place and, he, and I, had, I had already had um, an offer from a band to go and rehearse with them to see what had, hap what had happened, you know. And um, <laughs> it was really, really funny actually because uh, <laughs> he, he'd heard that from the manager of this band that I was supposed to be rehearsing with that I was living in Lyon. So <laughs> what happened was he came to my place and said he'd come to pick me up, which wasn't true. Uh, because the other band was supposed to be coming a, uh, an hour later. So he picked me up, right? I thought he was a member of the band. And uh, I went to his rehearsal room. There was two other guys. And uh, in like, what, three hours, something like that, we'd already wrote uh, four songs. And um, I went back to my place, re rehearsed with them for a couple of days more. And then around about a week later, uh, the manager from the band calls me up and says, you know, what's happening? Uh, why didn't you come to the rehearsals and all that? So I said, yeah, it's, I said, what are you talking about? We've, I've been to the rehearsals, we've already wrote like half an album and everything. And uh, <laughs> they just, he just said, well, no, you haven't been here. And I said, yeah, well, I said, you're mad, you're mad and all that. And uh, he, he came up, he came up, he came around to my place and he, sa he said, who's the guy who came to see you? And I said, this small Armenian uh, drummer and he said, it's called Noel. And I said, yeah, yeah, it's Noel. And he said, that's not the band. So he nicked me. He nicked me from the other band. Uh, and from there, we just, you know, I've, I've known Noel for around about 25 years now. I've had five, five bands with him all together. 
And um, next to my, uh, next to Mick, he's the guy that I know the most. You know. JP's another problem. JP, I, I, I've known for around about 10 years. Um, and um, when, I, when I met JP, it was, uh, it was in Lyon again, because I was looking for a guitar player um, to do a bit of cafe concert work that I, I was doing in clubs um, around France. And I needed a guitarist to back me up because I, you know, when I play guitar, it's shy. So um, I needed some, somebody to play, play good guitar. And uh, that was about 10 years ago. And I asked him if he'd like to play bass afterwards uh, with Slaughter, as Nigel uh, couldn't, couldn't continue. I mean, he did the first uh, Holidays in the Sun, but um, he couldn't continue because he had too much work on him. He was, he wor I think he lives in Denmark or somewhere like that, and he has a large company. We had an offer off Darren Russell to headline one of these Holidays in the Sun festivals. Uh, five, I don't know, five, six years ago, even longer. So I spoke to Wayne and said, are you up for it? And he says, yeah. Um, and uh, he says, but I've been working with this rhythm section, so uh, I want to use them. So I'm like, cool, man. And my first impression was he was fucking brilliant. I mean, really one of the best drummers I've ever worked with. I remember Steve, when we played in LA, we did an American tour, um, I think last year. And Steve, Steve Jones came down to one of the shows, and, uh, and Steve's really a stickler about drummers, you know. He's like, where'd you get him from? I'm going to fucking nick him. Uh, so my first impression of Noel was cool-looking guy, great character, and a great drummer. And uh, J.P. Tully, the bass player, my impression of him was uh, he just reminded me of a bass player. He was kind of like quiet, but a great musician. He's also a great guitar player too, uh, and I like you know I liked his character. Um, Gain looked pretty cool, so. Where did you meet him? Um, oh yeah, where did I meet him? It was actually at the Blackpool show, at the Holidays in the Sun, um, and uh, we actually I flew in fr from L.A. to Manchester, but because we hadn't played for many many years, we decided to rehearse in Manchester for a week. And uh, so that was like meeting the guys and uh, I thought, fucking yeah, it's cool. Sounds good. <laughs>